and welcome to this video for Electric Pages. I'm your host, Robin Mitchell. Today we're here at Electronica 2024 in Munich and it has been an absolutely wild event and I'm joined by my very good friend, Jeff, from NXP. Yeah. Thank you ever so much for having us today. No problem. So just before we dive into all the content and the stuff we're going to be talking about, just quickly tell the audience who you are, what you do, and what you like to do in your free time. All right. Uh, my name's Jeff Steineider. I'm GM for Industrial and Network Edge Processors at NXP. And uh, my free time, when I can get out of Texas, I like to go skiing. Skiing? Yes. So you're from Texas? I'm not from there, but, but I live there now. But you live now. in Texas and you ski? Yes. Why do you ski? I, we, we go to uh, places in the Rockies, so Utah, I was about Colorado. Because I'm pretty sure last time I checked, Texas was one massive it's flat not, piece it's of It's not land. a good place to ski. <laughs> it's not going uh, uh, yeah, to. You could try skiing on the sand, but I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> anyway, so we've seen lots of cool stuff at uh, Electronica this year, and I'm kind of curious to see what NXP is bringing to the table. So just tell us, what is it that you guys are currently working on? Yeah, so right now we're announcing our new IDATMX 9.4 family of applications processors. And this is a new family that follows some previous announcements uh, in the IMX 9 series. Follows our IMX 9.3, IMX 9.1, and IMX 9.5. What really sets this family apart from the others is this mix of real-time low latency processing along with the integrated networking that's on this device. So, and forgive me for this, but the last time I actually, uh, so the, the last sort of processor architecture I remember seeing coming from Mega NXP was the I, I, I think the IMA sort of series. And that was a number of years ago, I think that was released, isn't it? So, for someone like me who hasn't seen, that, seen the changes in recent years, what, what, what kind of advances have, have, have there been since that release? So I kind of get an idea of where you guys have been going. Yeah, so, uh, you know, with this particular IMX 9.4, we are integrating Ethernet switching, right. uh, which supports TSN, okay. as well as industrial protocols. Yep. Uh, we have a much higher mix uh, of Cortex-M cores. So this device actually has four Cortex-M cores, two Cortex-M7s, yep. and two Cortex-M33s. Uh, we have integrated machine learning into the device with our EIQ Neutron NPU. And then we've also enhanced the security functionality with our EdgeLock Secure Enclave, and that's now supporting post-quantum cryptography. Right. So let's start with the core itself. So, mm -hmm. so, so the ARM, ARM Cortex. So let's just go through that list again. So, so it's four cores. Yeah, so actually it's a octal core device. So there's oh, really? four A55 cores. I thought there was more than four. Yeah, you were I thought, hang on, that's more than four. There's four A55 cores. Uh, right. And that's for and your that's applications processing. Yeah. Yeah. You can run Linux on that. You can run a third party RTOS. Oh, and then you've got these two M7 cores and the two M33 cores. Two M7s, two M33s, guys. That's another four yes. smaller, lower power by controllers. Yes, and also yeah. real time and low latency. So, you know, the the real yeah. desire for this part is it's going to be used for real time control. Yeah. And so you're going to use those M7s to control motors, yeah. um, drives, yeah. other things that need that. And, and it also sounds like that, well, the kind of the kind of application I'm, I can definitely see this happening is going to be anything industrial whereby you have a Linux real, uh, sorry, a Linux operating system kind of like doing the heavier back end stuff that's exactly. not so I/O dependent. Yes. And then you have smaller cores which are kind of like more rapid in terms of res responding to I/O in real time. Yes. So in terms of the frequency of that main core, what, what kind of frequencies are we talking about in terms of uh, This will be upwards of um, I think 1.6 gigahertz. So. Oh, right. oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. This is a oh, this is a heavy hitter. Then this is a quad core AM uh, A53 A55s. A55s. Oh, damn, that's, that's got some real yeah. specs in it. So, so, it's, so, so this will really of, offer a lot of capabilities for our customers. And, and so in terms of RAM and that kind of options, what, is it integrated or is it external? Is it going to be? So it's it's got a LPDDR4 in, uh, in built into it. No, that'll be uh, to an external. Yeah. But then we also have really increased the internal uh, on-chip SRAM, and that's really to supply those real-time cores. So the M7s and the M33s will have tightly coupled memory. And, got, and, and, and so it's kind of like a microprocessor and microcontroller hybrid where yes, you've got like yeah. one section's a microcontroller, one section's a microprocessor, and they're working together. They're working together. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, in, so in terms of SRAM for those microcontroller cores, what are we looking at? Uh, we've got, I think, 1.5 megs uh, dedicated to those, and then uh, 3.5 megs. And is that, like a, is that like a shared memory across all four cores? Uh, they've got a couple that I think uh, are partitioned to individual cores, and I can get you the details. And it's, kind of, on it's, that like a, it's sort of like, so it's not a continu contiguous space. It's more no. a case of you have these little partitions, but in total you have that that kind yes. of size. Yeah. And so that 
but that but that sort of separation, I suppose, does allow for segregation of, of applications. So if something goes wrong in one core, the other cores aren't going to. Well, and, and that's where the uh, integrated safety island comes in. So uh, these cores can these, also yeah. be in this integrated safety island, and so this will provide our customers with the ability to. Basically, we can certify this device to be either safety integration level two for IEC 61508 or ASIL-B with ISO 26262. And you can choose whether you've got one M33, an M7, or both of those cores in that integrated safety island, and they are isolated, and they will perform automatic self-checks around the chip as well as through some of the I.O. for the system. And so does that, Gene, so, so does that sort of mean that like engineers could have almost four identical applications running, whereby you have a redundancy system? So if one fails, but another one to take over, or is that not something you'd probably do in a design like that? Yeah, it's it's more that you're going to have a checking mechanism mm -hmm. uh, that's running in that safety island, um, and maybe doing some sub sub parts of an application, but it's not an automatic takeover. Yeah, it's really to determine is the rest of the device working correctly, I, and if it, not. It's more about you know, it's, do a control it's shutdown. More like, it's more like hyper parallelism, whereby you have yeah. lots of tasks going at the same time, different tasks, but you want to make sure that if one fails, the others don't fail too. Correct. And that's where something like auto automotive comes in. So let's say you've got like a, a like a I don't know like a, a, a an EV controller, and you want to make sure that you're monitoring the battery for for health, you're monitoring the doors, monitoring the lights, but you don't want to make it so that if your uh, door switches stop working and the brakes stop working and the accelerator stop working, so you want all these systems completely isolated and separated. Right. So that's just, so would, is this just for industry or would it target other applications too? So uh, we've got lots of industrial applications, so factory automation is yeah. certainly a huge space, building automation, energy management, um, you know, managing batteries as you're starting to see those applications reach outside of just cars uh, and actually hit utilities and buildings now. Yeah. Um, but also into telematics applications for automotive. So acting as a telematics gateway. Um, and, and does that mean that there are there are automotive grade versions? Yes. It? Oh, fantastic. Yes. Okay, so this is, okay, because this is what, uh, I, I was kind of thinking, is it just industrial? But no, no, it, it's also automotive as well. So you, yes, okay, it's going to go great. into both markets and there oh, will excellent. be uh, part numbers that have automotive grade yep. and then others that have our industrial qualification. And again, in those applications, that's where that safety island becomes really important yes. so, that, so, so that, you know, if something goes wrong, it doesn't affect everything else. Um, so, Another feature you mentioned that I'm kind of trying to, I, I, this is something we're seeing in more and more devices, which is AI. Yeah. So just go, just tell me a little bit about, you know, the kind of specs this has got, how is it working, what you sort of see it being used in. Yeah, so we've been integrating uh, our Neutron neural processing unit um, in a lot of the IDNMX 9 devices so far. And really where we're targeting this is for applications like predictive maintenance or anomaly detection. Right. And so, you know, you talk about getting in all those IOs, you might be managing multiple drives, multiple motors on the system, you're going to get a lot of sensor data or yep. data on, you know, voltage and current from managing those systems. And so, you can use this uh, machine learning acceleration to basically look and, and determine the health of these systems. Are they about to need maintenance? Are they starting to lose efficiency? And then even do things like planning further ahead. What's my power draw going to be, and things like that. I'll say, over the sort of past five years, I'm seeing a trend whereby everything that you know people integrate or need in industrial applications is really starting to overlap with the automotive industry as well. So you talk about predictive maintenance in an industrial environment. That's going to be critical because you know you've got some machinery it's operating. You don't want it to fail, and you want to make sure you can repair it before it properly breaks, where it becomes even harder to mend. Yeah. But you want the same in a vehicle. Because Absolutely. As it's operating, because it's essentially, it's a piece of machinery, like yes. an industrial piece of equipment. So it's a really interesting trend to see these sort of overlaps. So, so now, now when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to AI and on-chip and, and on-chip sort of functions, I also know that NXP does a bunch of other stuff as well. I, I think you guys have done the, uh, you've got your, uh, your, your, your voice engines and you've got all these manner of other uh, sort of uh, uh, offerings. Is this something that's going to be in these chips as well, or is that something that's going to be? Well, in the you know, our, our voice offerings are really a combination of kind of software that, that oh. could be applied to lots of different chips. Yeah. Uh, we have our overall EIQ software development kit, yeah. and this is really to enable our customers to push machine learning to the edge. Yeah. Because what we think is really important for the industrial space uh, and, and all the different markets we play in is, yeah. you know, IoT happened. People started collecting all this data, but I think they quickly discovered shipping it all to the cloud and 
trying to make sense of it there was either very expensive from yeah. a bandwidth standpoint, there were security concerns, yeah. or you couldn't actually get those decisions back fast enough. So being able to actually make decisions at the edge in real time is critical for a lot of our customers. They don't want to be dependent on having a cloud connection. And so we've been working to enable that. The EIQ software lets customers either train their own models, uh, building from the data that they've got, and it gives you the complete capability to do that and then deploy those models on any of our NXP silicon that we support. And this is this is what I was going to, I was actually going to ask you about how, how customers can train their own models for all these things. Because again, so it's something that always worries me a bit when it comes to uh, integrating AI into microcontrollers and all these different models is that how easy is it to train them and how easy is it to deploy it? So, and, and it sounds like what you're saying is that you guys are actually providing the libraries, you provide the software tools and the, and the training kit. Do, do you also provide the training mechanisms as well then? Uh, we try to use a number of like open source uh, models. Oh, so, so, like, so that basically PyTorch. Yeah, things like oh, you know, PyTorch so, or again, or, uh, yeah. so you build an AI model in PyTorch, and you can essentially target it to that platform. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so it's yeah. basically kind of two operating models: either customers bring their own data and they can train a model themselves, or if they've got a pre-trained model yeah. that they've developed already, you know, in the cloud or you know on a different system. We let them, you know, help them optimize that so we can run on this embedded hardware. Oh, excellent. And so, so that actually also helps customers who then want to move away from different platforms. Yes. So let's say you trained yours on a, on a GPU and you, you know, you're currently running it in the cloud, like yeah. I say, you can now go, actually, I'm going to take that model, shrink it down, put it on that ship. Yes. Um, so in terms of industrial applications, with, with, you know, we talked about predictive maintenance, and we talked about where the AI can be used, but in terms of like sort of on-chip processing of data, what, what other advantages do you see that bringing to an industrial application using the latest, uh, is it the IAMX9 4? Yes. Yep. Because a 9.5 is a different one. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, I think having those Cortex A cores uh, yeah. and allowing customers a very rich operating system that you have available with Linux, you can now very easily do cloud con uh, connectivity, yeah. you can run gateway functions, you can add security functions. I mean, we're seeing Security become, I think, a huge concern for a lot of our customers. We've got On legislation coming. Absolutely, because think about all of these going into factories. I mean, the assets that you're trying to protect there. You've seen what's happened with ransomware and different applications, hospitals. Well, I, think about the money lost if you manage to basically shut down a factory. I, I'm not sure this is a modern phenomenon, but I have actually seen increasing increasing attacks on PLCs. And these, because as these devices become more and more complex, they become easy and easy to penetrate compared to what they were before. Like before, if it's a pick microcontroller, you can't hack that. It's a microcontroller, it's right. never going to be hackable. But you take something like, oh, this runs a Linux system with a connection, you go, hang on a minute, now it's got entry points, it's got vulnerabilities, it can run arbitrary code. And so these sort of concerns come. So, so in terms of like your device, how does your device help to protect those concerns from a security point of view? Yeah, so we've taken a lot of the technology from our edge lock secure enclaves, or uh, secure elements, yeah. and we've created this edge lock secure enclave, which is now a part of every i.m.x9 device. And it gives you complete physical separation for your security functions. So there's no time sharing of this functionality. It's got a ring fence around it. The only way the customer programmable portion of the chip interacts with it is through a very set API, and it offers you, you know, basically uh, tamper detection, secure boot, uh, protection of secrets, management of those secrets. And we can even augment it with a edge lock to go service, which allows us to provide unique certificates and yeah. keys for every single device and help our customers actually deploy that. Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, I like that. The, uh, yeah, because, I'm just seeing this one through because you mentioned about the, uh, the fact that you have an API between your security functions and your, and your customer end sort of yeah. programs. That's an interesting way of doing it because you don't want to have a situation where you where you completely expose the underlying memory contents, hardware, right. whatever it is. You want to almost make like a like like almost like a an insulated bridge connection whereby yeah. you can only send a few commands and only a few things can be done with that. Exactly, it's a very set interface. I think it makes it easier to use. Yeah. So. The other difficulty that you know we've seen over the years is when you have all of those security options exposed, it's very complex. Yeah. And, and if you do something wrong, you may not be actually getting That's the security you want. Exactly, so yeah. by simplifying that interface, we make it easier for our customers to adopt these features. You also provide, I think, a better path for future upgrades. So on the topic of security, a lot of devices tend to be 
unsecure from, how do you say, they, they, they tend to build security up as you go. Is your device secure from, from the get-go and then you have to make it unsecure to do things with it? Does that kind of make sense? Like by default it's secure, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's, we have to give our customers options, yeah. uh, I think, so I don't know that I would put it as a, it's, it's got a default to be secure. I think there's lots of different capabilities that customers need to be used, so we don't force them to use security, yeah. I would put it that way. Yeah. Um, but, but the they, options are there if they need Yes, it. And, and they can layer it on and choose and which aspects. And by using those API type communication mechanisms, you're making, it, you're making it simpler and less likely to be abused by, yes. by someone else who's, who's, who's trying to get access to the system. Right. And, so, and, I think, and I think that's a really, actually, that's a really interesting way of doing it because the moment you, the moment you integrate an API interface, you, you suddenly restrict what is possible. The only way that you can then break into that system is then to manipulate the API itself. So unless there's a fatal bug in the API, the chances are there's nothing. There's not much you can do with it. So that's, that's a really interesting concept. Is, is that a relatively new concept? Well, it's it's new to our IDMX9 family, but uh, has now been kind of, I guess, in production for over two years now. Um, and it started on a few other devices uh, before we took it to the IDMX9. But this and, is kind of the direction we're going forward so, with all of our applications processes. Yeah. And in terms of applications for the uh, IMX, I, IMX, no, IMX 95, sorry, no, IMX 94. 94. 94. Yes. Um, where, where else do you see it being used besides industrial systems? So uh, automotive telematics, so you you know, basically things. manage all of that data that yeah. you're collecting from the car, providing that back through a cellular interface, uh, communications in and out of the car. And so that you know, takes advantage of the processing capabilities, the security, and then certainly the integrated networking that we have on the device. And is this something, do you think it could also be used maybe uh, on edge servers as well? Maybe something like a small IoT local I uh, edge server where you might have it sort of closer to your end endpoints, but not so far away in the data center. That makes yeah, sense. yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a really broad range of industrial applications that maybe don't have a, a real discrete name like programmable logic controller or PLC, well, but you get these automation controllers yeah, and, that sit at that higher level. Yeah, because that's one thing I, I think, I do think that the end, the time of the PLC might be coming to a close in the sense that there could be a new source of variation. So instead of having one PLC per machine, you might have a, a generic PLC control, but that might do five different systems and it brings everything together. So you can sort of like reduce the amount of hardware that you need, which also reduces the number of failure points. And then when you introduce these sort of uh, these safety islands, you can also make those PLCs a lot more robust and, yeah. and have higher degrees of safety features. And so it's a really exciting time, isn't it, for, it is. uh, for, for industrial control. So I would, I'm already trying to think to myself, how would I use that in a system? And I think the way I would do it, I think I can sort of see these, like I said, a larger generic controller that sits above everything else. And I think eventually you could then just get rid of those PLCs and then replace that. It becomes like the mother of all PLCs, mm -hmm. essentially. So one cabinet, 500 machines, and it's yeah. just sort of handling it all. So before we wrap this video up, I've got one more question for you. For the audience who are watching this video, if they want to get involved with NXP Solutions and try out the IMX94, what would you recommend that they do? So, uh, you know, I think uh, reach out to your closest NXP salesperson or uh, one of our distribution partners. Um, we'll start sampling this device in first half of 2025 uh, and then going into production uh, about a year after that. But, there will be uh, opportunities to engage with us either through Alpha program uh, for some of our lead customers and then we'll open that up a little bit broader as we get further into 25 through a beta program and then we'll go into a full mass market launch after that. And so when can they expect these devices? Sorry, sorry. In terms of, in terms of uh, year, sorry. Production will be uh, early 26. Like, like new year? Sorry. Of 26. 20, 20, 20, 26, 26 production, 20. yeah. But, so, but samples will be but available the samples first too. half of 25. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for taking the time hey, to stay. It's been an thank absolute you. pleasure. All right. Thank you.